I'm Abigail Ramsbottom, Curator of Education at the South Dakota Art Museum. And I'm Taylor McEwen, Collections and Exhibitions Curator. Uh, welcome to the fourth and final virtual artist chat featuring artists from the South Dakota Governor's 10th Biennial Exhibition. The Biennial Exhibitions aim to recognize and encourage South Dakota artists to promote the artistic identity of South Dakota and to foster a larger sense of community and connection among artists within the state. We're so happy you're here this afternoon. The biennial exhibitions are in large part made possible through generous grant funding from the South Dakota Arts Council. This virtual artist chat is made possible through the generous donations um, from supporters like you. Because the South Dakota Art Museum receives operational funding from South Dakota State University and the South Dakota Arts Council, your donations, memberships, and gifts fund fantastic exhibitions and programs like this. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for being here today. We're so happy to host you. And it's so special that we can do these virtually and connect with all the artists statewide. Uh, shortly, we'll hear from four artists featured in the biennial whose work is on display at the South Dakota Art Museum in Brookings through May 14th. Joining us uh, this afternoon are artists Bridget Beck, Bonnie Halsey Dutton, Dennis Lynn, and Alan Morris. Each artist will share about themselves and their artwork, followed by a brief Q&A. Please save questions for the end of the program or feel free to put them in the chat throughout. I will introduce each artist and moderate the Q&A at the end of the program. And very briefly, I just wanted to give you all a chance to see some installation shots we have um, featuring the artists um, who are talking with us today. But if you can make it to Brookings to see the show before it ends, we would love to see you. So we'll be starting with Bridget today and I'll be reading her artist statement. Within the confines of the page, her drawings create portals for the viewer to enter the space sculpturally. She layers several ideas, histories, and emotions with direct bold strokes of the brush. The scale of the drawings allow her to purge personal anxieties and freeze them in other worlds. The drawings attempt to transport the viewer to a very weird black and white somewhere else, a place where she doesn't logically edit ideas and cannot lie. She can instead create a psychological visual balance honestly. This placates the pain of never being in control. It helps for a little while to know that one person can explore alternative realities with ink. Her art reveals the complex intersections between place, mark making, object, and action. Bridget? Hello, yes. Uh, so uh, like you had mentioned, I, I have a kind of a dual practice. I'm a sculptor and I'm also, I also draw. Um, and lately I've been doing these very large drawings that um, kind of come from a sculptural drawing space, um, which is a little bit different than um, drawing a place that exists or that might be a part of an actual reality. <laughs> so I'm living in sort of this elsewhere sort of space, and that's kind of where my drawings are. Um, what I have been trying to do recently is sort of be able to recognize, reconcile all of those things that we want but we can't have um, at the same time in the same place. I'm sort of gifting myself a space to have every single thing I want even though it might not make sense. So um, this drawing, for example, it is sort of talking about life and death. It is sort of talking about gluttony and health. And um, what it portrays is actually, you know, a burger, right? That is one of the staples of the American diets that we don't necessarily think too much about, but also sort of wishing for the life that comes from that meat to be present at the same time. So not only am I eating the deer, but I am sitting at the table with the deer too, um, that it's a cake, it's a burger, um, and just different sort of textural elements sort of on the, just kind of ranging sort of in between um, co complete nonsense and then just sort of this joyous happening type of thing. 
Um, the process that I went through, it's basically just a huge piece of watercolor paper. I like to work big because my sculptures are large. If you want to go to the next slide. So here are some other really large scale drawings that are kind of doing the same. Uh, the uh, drawing on the left is sort of showing me creating these worlds. If you can kind of sort of see this abstract sort of lightning bolt-esque background, but there are small little communities that are living inside of those brush marks. And um, in my pocket is a paintbrush and a small flower, which also exists on my shoulder. So it's kind of uh, doing sort of multiple things. Um, I am holding sort of this beacon, which is also a jingle bell, which is also sort of a lightning rod. Um, and I'm also not holding it. It's sort of like it is connected to myself, but it's also somebody from the outside coming in. So it's sort of just this big contradiction in terms. Um, the one next to it, I call this Spearfish Ocean. And um, I was for a long time on the West Coast in California and in Oregon. And then I have recently come back to South Dakota. So it's just sort of going from larger spaces like LA and Portland and then coming to Spearfish to live and to have my family and to create art, sort of the contradiction that exists between what is vast and what is closed off. Next slide. So my sculptures are large architectural steel pieces that invite interaction. So the sculpture on the left is the black sculpture is called composite sketch. And what I had been doing in grad school, I went to UCLA um, for grad school was to create three dimensional drawings, which you can kind of see in my larger ink drawings. But instead of one drawing, right, it's 360 degrees of drawing. So trying to keep that space active. Um, that sculpture was sort of the first that I made all in black. My normal sculptures uh, are like the one on the right, which is called PlayStation. Um, and it has swings. It has a few picnic areas on the top. If you've ever been to Franconia Sculpture Park in Minnesota, um, near Minneapolis, St. Paul. I lived there for a while. I was the resident artist at Franconia Sculpture Park for many years. And I created these large scale pieces that are again, very sort of out of this world. I kind of create sculptures in the way that I create my drawings. I create places that I want to exist, but don't or can't. Um, I really sort of like the idea of play and joy, but at the same time, recognizing that as a community, we don't have these spaces. Um, next slide. So recently, this is kind of an interesting story. This year I created a stage set um, for St. Paul Academy uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I actually was contacted by their theater director who had been to Franconia Sculpture Park. And he sent me the sketch of my sculpture that you saw previously, PlayStation. And he had reimagined my sculpture as a stage set for um, the play Matilda by Ronald Dahl. I don't know if you have read that book. Um, and he contacted me and he was like, would you ever be interested in maybe doing something with us. And I was like, absolutely. This is kind of my jam because I love working with the community. It Matilda is a fantastical sort of scene. And so what I did was I drew up a sketch of the set, sent it to him. And then I did a whirlwind build. I went there for uh, the president, long President's Day weekend and I basically used everything that they had left over in the sort of their stage set department um, and just like went crazy 12 hour days building this thing. It was exhausting, but then they had the performance on it and they sent me um, photographs of it and a video of it. And it was so cool to see them sort of interacting on it like people interact with my sculptures. So, um, 
that is kind of the slides that I think I have for today. I think I'd just like to quickly talk about um, the idea of what a drawing can do and what a sculpture can do and how I am really in the midst of this sort of strange uh, duality with them both right now, which is really exciting. Um, so right now I'm creating some more sculptural pieces um, that are not really for anything in particular. Right now in Spearfish, I work at the welding shop out here and I'm creating kind of this uh, rocket ship type of sculpture. It's like an emotional support vehicle, um, sort of a place where all the people I love can come and join. And then like in a case of, you know, complete chaos and disaster, we can take off in the ship and, you know, head to outer space. So part of that is sort of reconciling my drawings with my sculptural practice. And what I have been doing, if you look at my website, is I have been drawing these black and white drawings on my sculptures recently. So I want it to be sort of a more of like you're walking into a book, an illustrated book, and a sculptural place. Um, so that is kind of what is propelling me to the future for sculpture. My drawings are interesting uh, space for me right now because the black and white of my drawings create sort of an even playing field for my ideas. Um, so it's kind of like, what can I actually build and what do I actually want and how can I kind of combine two-dimensional and three-dimensional space? So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bridget. And if you have questions, uh, you can throw them in the chat. We'll get back to them uh, at the end of our conversation today. So next we'll be speaking with Bonnie and I'll read her art statement as well. The interplay of pattern, color, and visual texture are common threads in her art. She paints complex interwoven forms and ideas, choosing subjects symbolic to her life as an artist and as a woman. Her work reevaluates barriers that she experienced, represented through healing forms from nature. Life experience can be shaped by the world. She utilizes watercolor on either ampersand, clayboard, or Yupo paper, painting with Aquafix by Shimki. This allows her to apply vibrant color in multiple layers. She finds her technique conducive to creating a glassy surface through the layering of multiple colors. Art history and world culture are her artistic muses and also compel her life experiences. Her artwork is represented in numerous public and private art collections, both nationally and internationally. Bonnie, I'll leave it to you. Well, thank you. Well, I too am from Spearfish, so Bridget, we'll have to get to, to meet each other. Um, yes, I'm kind of in a point of transition in my life right now. I've been painting uh, with two different subject matters. Uh, I, I work in a series of work, and so I usually will, will explore something in great depth before I move on. And so I've done a lot of very colorful landscapes of the Black Hills as one of my series. And my second set of series is, has been inspired by trade beads. Um, I find them just fascinating because my interest in world culture and archaeology and find how these beads that have been unearthed, excavated, are showing mankind's uh, circumnavigation of the earth really before recorded history. For example, uh, beads found from Egypt can be found in Iran. And so you, you know that somehow these beads changed hands to go to a new location. And I've always found that very interesting. I don't really know why the beads draw me so much. I think it's mostly about the pattern and the texture. Um, I, I explore uh, painting them with, as, as um, was read uh, with ampersand clayboard or uh, Yupo because I can paint in layers and get that glossy, vibrant uh, texture of the beads. And so that's been kind of finding its way into my landscapes. So in this, in this um, slide that you're looking at, you can see the portrait of myself. I'm painting um, one of my bead paintings. And you can see how it's kind of starting to make itself present in my landscapes. 
the landscapes I've always used bright colors, kind of non-local colors, uh, looking at nature through rose-colored glasses uh, in, in a way to uh, exemplify how I feel about nature, the, the, the feelings that I have inside when I'm in nature. I'm using color to help add that vibrancy. Next slide. So again, here we have the two series of works. So you can kind of see the transition that's happening. Um, I called the one on the left with the trade beads. It, it, I'm looking at it as currency, how, how humans have used beads as currency, as well as many other trade items throughout history. And this idea of the splashes of color and the interplay of pattern intrigued me as an artist because I like the paintings that you can't force your eye to even to, to not move around the composition. I think it's very hard to look at it and not have my eyes want to move throughout it. So I, I've been working with that concept into my landscapes. So if you look over here on the right, um, this is my favorite spot in Spearfish Canyon. It's by Savoy, uh, where Rough Lock Falls is, uh, where, where the road branches to go towards Deadwood. And again, it's more of an idealized version of landscapes because I've added what perhaps was in the foreground before the, the highway went through. Um, just again, trying to get that, that spring-like feel um, and the vibrant color, the burst of nature and uh, flowers blooming. Okay, next slide, slide please. So as I mentioned, I'm, my life's in a bit of transition. I've been um, coming up against a lot of barriers of late. And it kind of stopped me painting for a while. I just wasn't sure where I was going with this. And then all of a sudden, the barriers became trees. And the trees had openings. And the openings were beckoning to me. And so these two different paintings are exploring that concept, which is kind of the, the crux of what I've most recently been working on. So there's foreground imagery, but I'm using color and shape and trying to pull myself through the composition uh, to see what is beyond. And so the, the titles Defined Obstacles is on the left and the right is Beyond Barriers. And that's really all I have for you. Okay, Bonnie, well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll get back to you for our second half conversation. Next, we'll move to Dennis. So Dennis Lynn has a wide range of experience in academia and was a professor of art at the Air Force Academy. He has won many regional and national art awards. He is a two-time recipient of an artist career development grant from the South Dakota Arts Council. He's won over 20 gold medals and many awards competing in the Northern Plains watercolor member shows. He's a signature member of the Red River Watercolor Society and he has won Best of Show and Many People's Choice Awards um, and First Place Awards at the Dakota Masterworks shows in Sioux Falls. His favorite accomplishment is the completion of 23 murals for the pediatrics clinic at the Rapid City Monument Hospital. Okay, Dennis. Thank you. As you can see, I love nature. I love to walk around, especially Spearfish Canyon, there's so many beautiful areas back in there. And I get off the beaten path, try to find these little streams and things that I can get uh, excited about. Lots of times I'll even start sketching a painting while I'm standing in the water, just to get a good feeling about it. I don't try to copy nature exactly as it is because I believe there's a lot of abstract colors and shapes in nature. I want to move towards more of an abstract naturalistic kind of artwork. So I'm, I'm not real um, concerned about being real tight unless it's doing a portrait or doing the interior of a church. And I think in my next slide, I think which that's okay. The one on the right is called Running Free. I love horses. I have a horse. Um, again, I love water. I love the way trees and give that abstract kind of bold color that you can abstract in it. If you were to blow that up, you would see that these colors aren't true to trees or leaves, but um, I still swing back to that naturalistic look of trees and definitely horses, uh, but I don't try to detail everything. You don't see all the hair, you don't see all the muscles rippling or whatever. I try to 
abstract a lot of these shapes and colors. And uh, with sunlight, I've always been trying to paint a sunlight picture. Those things are so hard to do. And to make water look like it's flowing, I want to try and do that. And I've been working at it for years. I just, uh, I don't know, I'm fascinated by the way sun shines through the trees and it changes the colors on the leaves and it changes the whole atmosphere of the thing. I'm trying to show that depth and atmosphere by lightening up a lot of the background colors. And uh, as I come forward in space, I try to make those colors and shapes a little clearer to give it some depth. Uh, the next slide probably shows some, oh, this is a watercolor of jeweler the jeweler, he's uh, one of our jewelers here in Rapid City. He let me um, hang out with him in his studio as he was making things. And I was fascinated with all the things that he has in there and all the different kinds of uh, foreshortening and perspective and all the crazy ways that light will change color in abstract areas. So if you look at that painting, you'll see that a lot of the colors are just washes in there. And uh, the bright area that he's uh, working on, a, a piece of jewelry, you can't even see what he had in his hands. It was so bright, and I tried to emphasize some of that. But I was really fascinated with the perspective and the way the shapes all came together in this painting. Uh, the Princess Little Pigeon on the right, she was uh, my friend, my friend's mom. Um, I did this painting for the National Veterans Creative Arts Festival. It took a gold medal last year. And I gave this painting to him and uh, my friend just passed away this year. So I was happy that I was able to do this for him and his family. It turned out really good. It showed the emotion of her. Um, and I captured that in her face and her eyes and her kindness and her intelligence. And I really love that family. So as you can see, I, I like to work with realism and it's, it's really a big influence um, on me. I love um, impressionism also. So I'm trying to incorporate more of that in my work. And the next slide is probably relief sculpture. These are relief sculptures. I use um, modeling paste and sand. I sculpt these shapes with dental tools, dental equipment. And then I paint it with acrylic paints. All these images that you see stick out from the canvas, uh, maybe eight to a quarter of an inch. And I sculpted all the angels and all the uh, different figures in this work. This will drive you crazy trying to do this kind of work, but I like to challenge myself. I like to do uh, realistic work and I like to um, do things that other people can appreciate and enjoy. And uh, so I'm really into some of these interior uh, images that I do. And I do this really low relief sculpture with the modeling paste and sand. And then I uh, paint over that. Uh, the piece that's called Order of Notre Dame, a lot of the stained glass window was done with the Prismacolor. And then I would go back into a lot of that and paint it with acrylics just to keep it looking as real as possible. Even though I wasn't that concerned with the realism, if you look at the edges, a lot of it fades away. And um, Lady of Victory, the, those angels were all sculpted and uh, painted white. And they were sculpted in modeling paste. That's it. <laughs> Short and sweet. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, some samples of your work. And we'll move to Alan Morris. Along the invisible line that divides North and South Dakota lies a string of quartzite monuments, obelisks engraved with symbols and glyphs that separate a land that was once united under a singular name. A landscape bearing the name of the indigenous inhabitants from whom the land was stripped, bifurcated and sold off parcel by parcel. This line of stone monuments to politics, separation, and territoriality is documented and explored in the body of work titled Silent Sentinels, a series of photographs, digital models, and 3D sculptures. 
Removed from the context of the landscape that they divide, these individual markers become impotent reminders of the power that these borderlines have socially, politically, and economically, not only between the two states named Dakota, but all of the borderlines within and outside of the United States. Uh, thank you. So I'm originally from Eastern Oregon and a recent transplant here to South Dakota. And for as long as I can remember, my art conceptually has been focused on concerns and questions and interrogations about the ideas of place, space, and how those things come together to help humans form and develop and evolve their own sense of self and identity. Uh, I moved here uh, instead of from Oregon directly uh, from a teaching position in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, where I was temporarily <laughs> calling it home uh, to this new place here in Spearfish uh, that hopefully will be permanent. And when I find myself in a new environment, I try to find um, how I fit into these unique spaces and by the by what these unique qualities of these spaces are. So not long after I set foot here in Spearfish, I discovered these border monuments. Uh, and the research that I sort of started to dig into was really fascinating to me that this visibly invisible line, uh, one that we only really see in terms of political maps, or um, if we're lucky in crossing the border between North and South Dakota on a major highway, uh, in a sign along the side of the road that tells you on which side of the line you are, uh, is demarcated by these unique and oddly beautiful individual markers. Uh, so with the help of the SDAC and the Puffin Foundation uh, out of New Jersey, I was able to spend a little bit of time last summer uh, exploring, documenting, and scanning photogrammetrically uh, the markers that I was able to find on publicly accessible land. In addition to being um, material for sculptural objects, I do like to think of these as almost um, like historical cataloging, the, the state of these markers. Originally, they were placed along the border around 1895, when the two states separated from the singular Dakota Territory. And over the past roughly 125 years have started to decay and degrade a little tiny bit uh, through natural wear and tear, but more often than not, as we can see in the bottom right uh, of this particular slide, uh, have been knocked over due to agricultural um, endeavors and other processes on the land. If we can go to the next slide. And as I've gone through the research and have started to explore, uh, I've come to realize that it's not just along the North and South Dakota border that we see these markers and monuments. On the right-hand side of this particular slide, we see another uh, granite obelisk from the Southeast corner of Montana, where Montana, Wyoming, and South Dakota intersect here uh, West River. So I find it very fascinating that these tri-point markers and these markers along the border, uh, first of all, exist. And they seem to be a fairly uniquely Midwestern Dakota uh, situation. Uh, so far in my research, I've been able to uh, photogrammetrically capture the markers uh, East River. Uh, and hopefully this summer we'll continue that uh, excursion out here West River to try to find as many as I can. In the process of scanning these models. I've also found the uh, interesting moments wherein families along the border have excavated the markers and moved them from their original locations. Uh, there was one particular family home um, where I believe six of them had been moved from their locations and had become extremely wonderful lawn art uh, come together in front of the home. Uh, as a closet historian, that kind of bugged me, but it was sort of interesting to, to see how the next chapter of the history of these obelisks are going to play out. Uh, and the last thing uh, that I have learned uh, in recent months is that it's not a North Dakota, South Dakota border phenomenon strictly. Along the South Dakota and Wyoming border, there also lie markers in much the same uh, constellation as well. How these typically work, uh, you can see on the left-hand image on this slide, 
uh, the mile marker for the fourth mile from the uh, east side of the state, so the Minnesota border. And they are scattered every half mile. So each of the half mile markers are labeled as section corners or SC monuments. And then the ones that are at mile marker lengths do have the uh, distance from east corner of the state uh, engraved on. Also in some of these monuments that unfortunately don't translate into their sculptural forms uh, are various um, hand etched notes and uh, kind of graffiti, if you will, left over the last 125 years of folks who have also encountered these monuments, uh, including one just east of the Missouri River uh, that I've sort of deemed the lover's marker. Uh, for more information, let me know. All right. Well, I have some anticipation. I'm interested in knowing what the lovers are writing. <laughs> so it was actually one of the markers that I was most interested in finding. I, I really had sort of hinged all of my research on finding this one. Um, the story goes that in around 1918, 1920-ish, um, there were two lovers that uh, in sort of Great Plains Romeo and Juliet style came from families who didn't get along very well, but were on adjoining ranch and farm parcels. And they would meet at this one particular mile marker that happens to be underneath a very large shade tree. Uh, and that's where they would have their romantic rendezvous. And so uh, I wanna say it was in 1919 or 1920, uh, the male character in this Shakespearean drama uh, etched his name and her name into the side of the mile marker. So visually it's there, but he didn't quite carve deep enough for the 3D scanning apparatus that I've been using to render it in a 3D print, unfortunately. Okay, fascinating. <laughs> All right, Alan, did, was that the end of your presentation? That was it. Okay, I'm gonna get out of the PowerPoint then. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, everyone, we're at the Q&A portion of this conversation. So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask it. And if the artists have questions for one another, I invite that as well. Hi, Bridget. Hi, John. <laughs> haven't seen you for a long time. I haven't seen you for a long time, too. Back in South Dakota. Yeah. That's great. Still For those of you, I worked at the old courthouse museum as an intern when I was going to Augustana College back. I graduated in 2000. So um, I had the pleasure of working uh, with John during that time. So I had the pleasure of working with Bridget. <laughs> it was fun. They did some wild stuff and still doing wild, wonderful stuff. It's yep. great. I think the last time I saw you was you had an exhibit at Augustana mm -hmm. and that was a lot of years ago too. Yep. Oh, great. I love your drawings uh, comparable to your to your sculpture. Really. Thank you. The really drawings are getting, are getting wilder and wilder. <laughs> like, I don't know if I can pack any weird, weirder stuff in, but I'm trying. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I'm, welcome back to South Dakota. Thank you, John. <laughs> I never got away. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm at the best place. We're at the best place. Um, I have a question for Mr. Morris. Um, do you, when when you find these um, these pieces, and then you reproduce them, do you make any alterations to them? Um, not strictly speaking, um, due to the technological. Um, 
prohibitions of how large I can print things with my 3D printers, I do end up having to print them in sections. Um, so in, in my artistic sort of way of thinking about this, it's the breaks in the reproductions is sort of like a break in the landscape itself that it's sort of referring to. Uh, took me a while to sort of come to be okay with that because for a brief moment, I was trying to figure out if I was just being a lazy artist and not wanting to patch and stack all the holes. Um, but in my mind, it makes sense. Um, so really the only things that are changing from the originals um, is the scale of things because I'm printing them at approximately one third scale and um, the overall color. So the originals are made out of Sioux Falls quartzite, which is this beautiful red, brown, ruddy, granitic stone um, that is really quite beautiful. Uh, but the finished pieces are rendered in white plastic and is sort of another way to, to question the power that these uh, monuments have uh, by stripping away the color of them and just bringing them back to their basic form um, without any of that extra visual stuff. Thank you. I have a question kind of regarding that. Um, put my hand up, lower it now. But um, Ellen, do you have any impetus to make your own mark in these markers and along these borders? Do you have any sort of want to become a historical part of the markers themselves, not just a catalog of them? You know, it's it's crossed my mind on more than one occasion. Um, but in as much as I want to, I. I, I just, I have to really sort of respect um, the uniqueness that they they exhibit and the characteristics they have. And I, I don't know if I really want to interfere with that. Although, who knows? I, I still have half the state to look at. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> but you could put your temporary marker there and record it as if, Maybe. <laughs> I have been thinking, um, because here next to me, I have a few uh, tiny markers that I've been uh, playing around with, perhaps taking one out and burying it next to uh, the original. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dissolvable markers. Right. And the great thing about the material that I'm using is that it is biodegradable. So in as much as the stone would last ostensibly forever, um, this plastic won't. And so it kind of puts a strange clock on things and adds another time element to the history of the, the markers themselves. I was going to ask Bonnie about the UPO. Yes. Yeah. Now, how do you treat the UPO before you start painting on it? Or do you treat it? I don't treat it. Um, I'm using schminky. It's a water, it, it's kind of like an acrylic medium, but it's made specifically for the clay board process. And I'm using it on the UPO in the same way. Um, that way I can layer the co colors and they don't lift up. Um, I do matte and frame the UPO because of the um, bendability, and bendability of the surface, uh, just mm -hmm. to keep it from, from I guess, getting cracks. I've, I've not noticed that it's done that, but it's not a, um, a long-term, I mean, it hasn't been around for a long time, so I don't know for sure. So I, I, I do matte and frame those pieces. The pieces mm -hmm. on clayboard, uh, the, the schminky uh, medium works as a varnish and, and they do not need to be framed. Um, I started using the Yupo paper just because of the limitations in size and weight uh, with the clayboard. So I wanted to work larger than what I was able to get clayboard pieces and the clayboard um, is, is very heavy to frame. I've got a, a piece back here behind me that's three foot by four foot and that's about as large as I can work with the clayboard. But with the Yupo paper, I can work much larger. So that's kind of why I've, I've branched into the Yupo as an experimental thing. Mm -hmm. I can get uh, crisper edges though with the clay board. The UPO is just a little bit softer edged when I'm working. Have you had any, Bonnie, I'm sorry, I'm full of questions, but um, have you had any interest in combining your two different series together in any kind of way? Or are you 
are you uh, needing to keep the series and these different kind of markers of your work separate? Well, they always have been separate, but just in this past year, they're kind of merging. So that was kind of showing how that, that pattern with the beads and, and the splashes of color and pattern are making their way into my landscapes mm -hmm. and adding more vibrancy to the, the natural landscapes that I'm doing. Yeah. Cool. I remember, Bonnie, seeing uh, one of your works at, there was a house show, I think a couple years ago, yeah. um, Spearfish here, and I saw your small, it was a small beaded um, work that I, I just loved, and so it's thank kind of, you. it's nice to meet you, so. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, the beads seem to be this passion. I, I feel like I've explored them, and then they show up in my work again, so there's something about that repetition and pattern that just draws me. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I have oh. a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Lynette. For, um, now I don't know his name. Uh, Mr. Lynn, um, did I hear... Um, uh, Abby say in the introduction that you provided some artwork for the hospital in in Rapid City. Yes. And I, I, and what kind I, of artwork did you create for that? On the pediatrics ward, on the on the uh, third floor, I did twenty three murals of animals, and they were simplified kind of animals, uh, but animals that they were interested in me painting horses, bears, antelope, buffalo, uh, owl, eagles. I painted scenes that you would see, you know, like buffalo out in the badlands with badlands in the background. And uh, what this was supposed to do was to help the patients get up and walk around so that they could uh, return to health quicker if they were up walking around looking at these murals. So they were in all the hallways on the third floor on the pediatric ward. And uh, if you ever get in the Rapid City, check it out. Oh, they definitely I will. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a project. I wore myself out. Yeah, I'm wondering, do you, you in that large of scale, was that a difficult process to to kind of go bigger? I um, that's probably as big as I ever painted. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the animals were uh, natural, you know, full scale. The horses weren't; they were a little smaller. But I mean, the eagles and the birds, and the, I had some mountain lions I painted. They were on a little bit smaller scale and bears so that they could fit on a wall, but the walls were, were you know, uh, up on a ward, they're pretty big. And uh, I put a different scene on the different walls. That's as big as I want to paint. <laughs> I really enjoyed the process. Made a lot of people happy. That answered your question. <laughs> I have a question for artists here. Uh, all, all, all of the artists, or even you know whomever. I'm just curious how you, f if you feel isolated here in South Dakota or not. Sometimes I feel that I am very isolated in South Dakota, in some ways. I think you're right. We don't have the audience that a lot of places have. I was stationed in San Antonio, Texas at Kelly Air Force Base and Randolph Air Force Base. And there were so many people that come down the river walk, you know, downtown. Um, people would, you know, a million people would see your artwork in the galleries every year, you know, and you could sell artwork fairly easily. I think I sold two paintings a month down there. So yeah, I do feel isolated here. It's, we need more people. 
<laughs> be our artwork. Let's get it out there somehow. Yeah, I agree. It, it's it's a small it's a small audience. I suppose today's technology helps us to reach beyond South Dakota, and we're lucky enough to live where it's beautiful. So the inspiration is there, but it is hard to meet the the market. Yeah, I would echo all of those sentiments, especially moving from the larger Chicago metro area, because essentially, let's face it, Milwaukee, Wisconsin is just a really big suburb of Chicago. Um, and we had a multitude of galleries uh, there when I was around for six years. And so it's it's been a little bit of a culture shock the past couple of years here in Spearfish. But I think as long as there's um, a cadre of us crazy artists who are willing to keep doing the work and spread the good word about what's happening in South Dakota, hopefully we can get some more recognition as maybe being a gigantic artist colony in the top part of the map. I agree. You know, Florence was, Florence, Italy was only just a little bit larger than Spearfish itself. So just back in the day, um, it's possible. Awesome. We need to get like a Duomo going on here. Get a, a Spearfish <laughs> Renaissance from one of the West River. <laughs> <laughs> we need a Medici. We need patrons. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, living in South Dakota all my life, um, I think uh, in the last uh, 20 years, things have improved a whole heck of a lot, especially in Sioux Falls. Um, there's, you know, with the sculpture walk and and uh, a lot of, uh, of downtown improvements and uh, the galleries and, and several artists moving into the area and even in Rapid City as well. Um, things have improved a lot, but there's a lot of room for improvement, that's for sure. So had, had uh, any of you artists gathered or convened before this artist chat? No. Um, it's I, kind of funny uh, because Bridget and I actually have a, a weekly meeting um, Mondays uh, here on the campus. We're in the community band together. <laughs> We're in the community band at Black Hills State University. <laughs> so, um, and also we teach together at Black Hills State University. <laughs> And honestly, Bonnie, I've actually seen you at the coffee shop a few times. So, okay, we gotta get we gotta get this conversation going. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's cool about these chats. So often, artists have connected that we're West River and East River. So it is kind of funny that you guys are in the same town and can connect now in person pretty easily. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and when I also when I saw John Richick was I mean I have. How long has it been, John? I mean, 20 years? Oh, probably. <laughs> At least. Pretty crazy. Over yeah. over 20 years, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great. Thank you very much. I have to go. And um, great seeing all of you. And, and uh, it's been interesting uh, listening to you. and. Uh, it's a uh, great uh, show and uh, hope to see more of your work in the future. We'll see you. And Thank Bridget, you. Uh, hope, hope to meet up to, with you here since you're in the state again. Of course, you're way out there. But um, one of these times, we'll see you. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a question um, for Bonnie. So, and it's it's kind of in line with Bridget's question, um, but I'm just wondering what, if you wanted to comment on the juxtaposition between kind of your very, I don't know, a specific place, your place, right? Documenting the nature around you 
in comparison to the beadwork, which is really about this global um, awareness, if that made any sense. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, I don't know if you had any comments on that. I guess I don't understand the question. Uh, about you, merging the, the two or uh, how they relate to each other? Well, I just wonder what what's the impetus of, because you said you're so fascinated by world culture. So you have this one lens that's very wide and then you have a very kind of closed in lens that's looking at the place that's right in front of you. Yeah, well, I have a PhD in art history and education. I've got a real interest in art history that has been with me my whole life. And so I think that's what the bead fascination uh, feeds to me. I've traveled the world quite a bit and, and done a lot of landscapes of other areas. Um, and as I return back home, it helps remind me that I live in an amazing place right here in the little spot of South Dakota. So uh, the paintings that I do of other world locations are just more for myself that I just kind of enjoy them as my own private memoir of the trip. Um, but it also, puts a, a, a spotlight on how I view my local region and it's in, encouraged me to paint more about the Black Hills. Lovely. And Alan, I wanted to ask, you are talking about this very place-based project as well. So are, when you were in Wisconsin, were you doing place-based work or when you were in other spaces, what kind of work were you doing? Yeah, so it's been kind of an interesting um, tra trajectory that's brought me here. Um, as I mentioned, I'm originally from Oregon State, and then I went to graduate school in Lincoln, Nebraska to get my MFA, um, moved to Wisconsin, and all of these places I sort of understood as being fairly temporary in the grand scheme of things after living uh, for the better part of 30 years in Oregon. Um, and so a lot of the work that I made um, before moving to South Dakota was definitely place-based, but was thinking about place in terms of the temporary nature of human existence, um, whether that's um, geologic time and how we're sort of a blip on the radar, um, or in just sort of like autobiographical time um, where I knew, say in Lincoln, I was only gonna be there for maybe three to four years. Um, and so what my relationship was like with that place. Um, and so prior to leaving Wisconsin, I started to explore um, the ideas of what makes a space into a place. And ostensibly it's the ways that we break it up. It's space plus history, it's space plus a different name. Um, and so I started to make work that sort of examined borders. And so it was just, the most serendipitous and wonderful thing to move here and find this really unique situation that only exists between the two Dakota. So definitely place has been uh, kind of at the forefront of my work for quite some time. Any other audience questions? All right, so to close off, I have a question for the artist. Is there a project that you're really excited about right now? Is there another artist that you're really excited about right now? What, what's kind of feeding your creative energy at the moment? I'm really interested in this merging of, of my beads and landscapes. I'm, I'm very motivated by um, to see how much pattern and texture I can put into a landscape painting um, and to try to get that same kind of crazy eye movement going on uh, with the bright colors. So that, that's really driving my work right now. I think for me, it's a little bit about experimenting with different materiality and different uh, approaches to the photographic medium. Um, even though I, I make my students give me a hard time, I haven't actually touched the camera in I don't even know how long. Um, I, I do wanna explore place in more sort of tactile uh, ways. So I've been thinking about and doing research on archaic uh, alternative processes that utilize soil as pigment 
uh, to make photographs of a place, literally of that place, um, my new place, essentially. Well, I can go next. I mean, uh, so my sculptures have been typically really difficult to place <laughs> just because of their interactive nature, the size and all of that. And um, for the first time, I'm working without any restraints. And I am really excited just to kind of go crazy in my own style without anybody telling me what they do or do not want. Um, so I have right now some, uh, I have probably like eight large metal propane tanks that I'm cutting up. Um, so I have all my material, I have the space, and I think I'm just going to take my time sort of building my rocket ship for a while. And for, for me, that's really exciting because I have been had that freedom before. I could go next, I guess. I'm working on etchings right now. Um, trying to do a lot with line for my drawing. I love your work, Bridget. I love those lines. I love the darks and the lights. So I'm trying to do a lot of that with just line. And I'm doing etchings with a Dremel pen. Oh, cool. And, and they're coming out pretty good. Um, I just came back from a festival that had a print in it, oh. and uh, we need to all go to Italy <laughs> and do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the master's work. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm really uh, excited about um, trying to create a lot of different kinds of lines and darks and lights and all of that. Cool. Love to draw. Awesome. Well, exciting things to come from all of you then. Cool. Well, are there any last minute questions from anyone else? We're kind of coming up on our time here. Thank you, you four, for, for your time and offering your, uh, your insights. It was fun to gather again today, and just a reminder, the, the show is up at, in Brookings through May 14th, and then it moves to Vermilion and Sioux Falls and closes in Rapid City next spring. So you can see it four times in four different ways. <laughs> yeah. But thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, have a great night. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.